So if you teach in a college classroom, you face a lot of challenges from designing your actual class to designing your lecture slides. And just in case you're new to my channel, hello, I'm Dr. Echo Rivera, and this is the channel More Than PowerPoint, where I help academics create engaging lecture slides. But yeah, I realized <laughs> that a class is much more than lecture slides, which is why I have brought on a very special guest, Dr. Jose Antonio Bowen. Welcome to my channel. And uh, Jose is going to be talking about those things beyond slides. Well, we'll talk about slides too, but Jose is... I mean, you do so many things, author, speaker, <laughs> academic, and so you just have so much insight to share. So yeah, thank you for coming along to my channel. I'm just really excited that you're here. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Great. Awesome. So yeah, let's just, you know, get started with, tell us a little bit about yourself and yeah, how you help with this sort of broader classroom environment, or I've even seen you um, refer to what you do as sort of helping people create liberating college classrooms, um, classroom environments. So yeah, just tell us a little bit about what you do and how you help. <laughs> well, we try to help. So, I mean, I started by trying to help myself. So my, my <laughs> career path was actually the pretty typical academic. You know, I'm in graduate school and I'm being assigned classes, you know, first as a TA and then, oh, you could teach that. And of course, the model is, well, I've been in classes, you know, I say, well, it's like, yeah, I've had my hair cut, too. It doesn't mean I can cut anybody else. Right. I've seen it done. I, yeah, you kind of right. You know, so but, you know, so I like everybody else. I start designing courses like the ones that I've been in. And of course, I remind faculty that we're a little weird, right? We we like school so much, we're still here. <laughs> right. So so we're we're the ones who did the work and and we're we're attentive during lectures. And so we you know we're just we were a little weird. We're still in school. We never left. So yeah. <laughs> uh so I wanted to become better. And so, you know, as myself, and that led me into this, you know, the the big the sea of pedagogy, uh, where I've never emerged. And so uh, you know, initially, you know, I, I'm a musician, so I was teaching music. And so that meant I taught piano lessons for a long time, but then I taught music history. And so, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, as a piano teacher, there's a, right, you realize a couple of things pretty quickly. The first is that you're with students for a very little time, right? You have mm -hmm. an hour a week or half an hour a week, mm -hmm. and then they spend six days away from you where a lot of good or bad can happen. And hopefully they come back better the next week. But often it's like, oh my gosh, they, they're not any better this week, but they practiced all the time. And it's like, okay, so clearly the problem is what are they doing with their time and how are they spending their time when they're not with you? And so a lot of what you do is try to make sure that students are practicing in the most effective way. And so that's one of the things that you notice because I do music. The other thing is that studio practice is right. It's one on one. It's a great luxury. Uh, you're, right, you're very intimate with the student. But we do a lot of demonstrating in music, which mm -hmm. is not necessarily helpful. It's like, no, don't play it like that. Play it like this. Yeah. <laughs> and and yes. of course, I realize them. But well, actually, the student's like, well, <laughs> what's what's the this? Yeah, yeah. It's like. <laughs> Uh, you know, of course, my, it's like, is it your arms waving or is it the, <laughs> the, the what is it about the this? How am I, how, what am I supposed to imitate? And besides, why would I want to imitate you? So, um, so th that changes the nature of the problem. Right? So the real problem is so how do I get you to find your voice? Mm. That's really the problem in music. How do I get you to figure out how you want to play it in the best you, you can be? So I have to talk a lot less. I have to do a lot less. I have to demonstrate a lot less. Uh, and so that led me to think about, you know, how people learn. And so I so I spent yeah. um, quite a lot of time, you know, going to workshops, starting to read the literature. Uh, at, when I started, there was a lot less of it. You could read all, you know, there was there were no teaching and learning centers for where I was. And I think a lot of places. And so um, it was kind of word of mouth. You know, somebody say, hey, I've got a syllabus. You want to see it? You know, and there, <laughs> there was a kind of a black market of, of <laughs> tips. We didn't right. have conferences. And so. Uh, yeah. but I was really trying to help myself. And so, uh, then I started going to the Lilly conference. I think it was the first pedagogical mm -hmm. conference I, I, I went to, cause I was at Miami of Ohio. Um, and, uh, there was a great center for teaching and learning. And so I was having conversations with people and that led me to experiment. And, uh, so that's, that's, that's how I got to, to thinking about the 
classroom and pedagogy. But then, you know, I did occur to me, I was, a, I'm a, right, I'm a music guy, I became the Dean of Arts. And so I had design people working for me. And so it did occur to me at one point, and, you know, I do a lot of innovation work. And this is, this is about the time that design thinking is starting to, you know, become an idea. And it's like, mm. well, it's really a design problem, right? Yes. Keep the, the, it's not about how much you know, mm -hmm. right? Or even about how much you can, how fast you can transfer information. It's not, you know, not a bits mm -hmm. per minute problem. Right. It's a design problem. It's what are the things that will help students figure things out for themselves. And so that was the big insight for me was that nice. the teaching, teaching is a design problem. And so I have to design my slides, design my syllabus, design my activities, design my classrooms. And then I got to figure out. And so that's how I got into this. Yeah. Nice. That is so fascinating. And I love that because I can, if I think about it, that's, you know, how I got interested in presentation design is I was doing it for myself and I hated it. I actually hated giving presentations in public speaking. So it was kind of a way for me to like overcome that and not hate it so much. And yeah, I kind of turned into this, this whole journey. So that definitely, I connect with that and Fun fact, I actually just started learning piano. So now I'll be starting piano lessons with the teacher soon. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, you'll see how much the teacher plays yeah. and how much the teacher talks about practice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, because I, I think that's, again, I, I, did, I didn't start off that way. I didn't start off thinking I need to provide yep. practice instructions because when I, right, I mm -hmm. got, here are the three pieces you're going to play this week. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll go home and I'll play those pieces all week. And But that's not the same as, well... You're going to play them in short sections. You're going to play them right hand and the yep. left hand. You're going to play them how fast, how slow, you mm -hmm. know, and I would, I would say to my students, well, so what would happen if you played it? How, what's the, what's the fastest you could go and not make any mistakes? <laughs> That's probably your first practice speed. Yeah, right? yeah. And then, and then maybe you want to do one time where you do make mistakes, but you keep right. And we talk about, you know, mm -hmm, how, mm -hmm. did, how does that work? And that was actually my first research in. Uh, what are called ballistic impulses, you know, how, how you kind of automate things like walking or a ballistic impulse. Uh, you, you don't yep. go left leg forward and the right, right. knee forward, right? right. You don't, you <laughs> automate the whole process. And so yeah. that's what happens when, when you're learning a piece of music too, is you automate sections right. and then eventually the whole piece, yeah. mm -hmm. which is why mm. when you get stuck in the middle or you, you have to start over, right? You can't like pick it back up because you were, you were in the middle of this thing and, and your brain doesn't know, start from the middle. Yep. Um, and so that got me thinking about, Interesting. Uh, how do you, how do you, how do you get past that? Yeah. So you talked about how, yeah, you know, a lot of people might do more demonstrating rather than sort of practicing and, and having the student actually do the thing. Would you say that's maybe one of the biggest mistakes that professors make when they're designing their class is too much just showing and demonstrating and not giving students enough chance to do it on their own or practice it or maybe... Yeah, I yeah, no, I think that's absolutely, I think, I think there are a number of mistakes that we all make. Mm -hmm. The first is that, right, we're experts, we have lots of connections, uh, we're also enthous enthusiastic, so we can talk for 50 minutes without taking a breath about our subject, and the truth is we could go to a 50-minute, I actually listened to a 50-minute lecture online yesterday, I think, what a weirdo. <laughs> me that is you know uh because i was i was enraptured and it was and it was you know, it was a guy sitting down reading his notes oh, I mean, it, wow. was, it wasn't a dynamic but it was his content <laughs> right but i'm weird i i actually yeah. like that sort of thing and so yeah, yeah. um so i think that we forget that most people you know just want to graduate and get away from this sort of thing. Uh, and they're not as good at following the thread of, of, a, of a series of you know, articulated paragraphs. Uh, so we too much content is clearly uh, a mistake we all make. Students can't absorb it. Mm -hmm. Absorbing it is not the issue. The, the, right, for me, learning is, is right. Learning is like uh, your, your brain is like a closet, right? Mm -hmm. And it's organized in a particular way that's unique to everybody. And when you get something new, you got to figure out where to put it. Yep. So when I give so you true. some new information, you, if you have a place to put it, you can store it and it like comes back. But if I give you one pedagogy book and you have none, right, you think, well, I don't know where to put this. Or I put it with the science books or I put it with the alphabetical section or put it with miscellaneous. And you probably forget. Right. Unless it has a yellow cover or something. Right. You remember mm -hmm. you remember something random about it. So so students are 
figuring out where to put stuff. So for us as an expert, we have lots of categories. We have lots of stuff. Oh, that's this. That connects with this. That connects yep. with that. That goes here. So we're doing that all the time. And so it's actually, we could listen to a lecture and then remember quite a lot of it mm -hmm. in our field. But a student who's a novice, it's right. It's 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 like it's like the it's you know with chunking we call it in psychology right. It's the difference mm. between trying to remember seven numbers and trying to remember a seven right. The reason, in fact, that the chunking guy worked for AT and T. Oh, the, I didn't know that. <laughs> the reason that we have chunking yeah. is because phone numbers are chunked uh, because he realized that right. How are people going to remember these long streets right? Like you could put them together in groups right. So we remember yeah. oh. 214 is an area code, and I know a lot of 21, right? And so, mm -hmm. so then it makes it a lot easier. So as as experts, we do that. So I think, you know, we we do too much content, we do too mm -hmm. much at once. Uh, we we forget that we make connections that students don't have. Um, so so the, the the biggest challenge for us is how do we take it back to where a novice would be? Mm -hmm. One of my suggestions is that when you write your learning outcomes that you show them to a friend who's not in your field. Yeah. It is, this makes sense. Um, and the same thing with where you start your subject. Where am I going to start today? And where, or is this an interesting problem for somebody who's not a microbiologist? You know, <laughs> is this an interesting problem for somebody who's not a Shakespeare scholar? Uh, and again, the best way to find that out is to ask somebody who's not an expert because they, mm -hmm. they don't have all the associations that immediately spring to mind uh, mm -hmm. for us. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, but as you say, the other thing we do is we we mm -hmm. demonstrate too much. We 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 generally talk too much. Oh, yeah. uh, but I think the, by far the biggest mistake is that we have so much to communicate and so much that's important that we think I have to give it to you. Mm -hmm. it, it's and it's kind of like the all you can eat buffet, <laughs> right? It's it's too much. It's like you don't have to make seventy five dishes. <laughs> Right, right. Four yeah. or five, and I can't yeah. taste this, even the sixth or seventh. 75 is overkill. And so we, we we often, and then students were surprised when they don't, you know, have any knowledge or recollection of what mm -hmm. we did, even three months later. Say nothing of five oh. years later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we say, you know, start with what you want students to know in five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the rest is, you know, ornamentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you may get a, a few of those things, but 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 what are the what are the life changing nuggets uh, that that you really want students to have? What's most important for their yeah. field, for your field, for their for their future career, et cetera? Um, but you, you have very little control over the rest. Yeah, that's so true. And like back to the um, the closet um, metaphor, you know, I think. Um, yeah, like I totally agree. You know, everybody I work with struggles with sort of like I have all this content and I want to give this content to people and just like pass this along. Um, and we forget that people sort of need help maybe organizing that closet and they don't they might not know where to put this new information. But I also, um, you know, one thing that I've also noticed is sometimes when we do that, when we when we just think we just need to have all this content and give it to people, we forget that sometimes they might already have things in their closet and there's no, there's not room for that thing because maybe there's a conflict or maybe, you know, like they, they would have to like take something out of their closet for that to even fit because otherwise, yeah, it's, it's just a, a fight or a conflict or there's just no room or something like that. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you, um, that's a good metaphor. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you're doing something that is you know, going to change the way I think about the world, Yeah. Mm -hmm. then I, I definitely already have a worldview. Mm -hmm. And so by far the easiest thing to do is just to say, no, reject, uh, <laughs> and then and then get on with my life. And in fact, right, that's how your brain and your amygdala are set up to function, right? The people who thought, tiger, hmm, pretty tiger, maybe not a tiger. Those people are dead. They got eaten, right? <laughs> the people who that yeah. passed along their genes to us. <laughs> the people thought, tiger, run! <laughs> right. Right. Right, right, right. And they were wrong <laughs> some of the time, right? They, it wasn't a tiger. Right. But the people who were like, I'm not sure it's a tiger, those people got eaten. So so, so we are designed to, to reject threat. And again, what happens when your amygdala goes off, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you, you take the blood away from the front part of your brain where your, where your cognitive, right? All of your, your difficult thinking happens and you send that blood to your legs so that they can run. So you actually, once, once you're scared of the topic, once you said math and my amygdala goes off, I, ca I can't think as well. I am not mm -hmm. physically capable of thinking as well. 
because I've been scared. And so I think actually a lot of the design problem of teaching mm -hmm. is how do we get past the amygdala? Yeah. How do we get past the human yeah. you know, fight or flight response? It's And it's a bit like a smoke alarm, mm. right? A smoke alarm is a little too sensitive mm. because what you'd rather have is a smoke alarm that goes off when you're flying the frying the plantains and you got the oil going and it's like, sure. okay, the smoke alarm went off and I'm annoyed. But that's better than the opposite of my house is burning down and my right. smoke alarm didn't go off. Yep. So so we have a smoke alarm that is overly sensitive, which is useful, even though it's annoying when you're frying stuff. And so our brain is set up to reject new ideas, which is useful when you're trying to get avoid the tigers. It's less useful when you're trying to learn math. But we that's the trade off that got us here. And so yep. your brain is a smoke alarm. And so the question is, if I want to fry stuff, I got to figure out how to trick my smoke alarm. I turn on the fan. I, you know, I would, all that kind of open the windows. What do I do? And so as a teacher, the design problem is, so that's why I talk about this idea of entry point, right? Where, where mm. you start is actually a real design. We think, oh, I've got, I got to cover these 10 things. Yeah. But, but the, the real question is if I want anyone to learn anything, I've got to think about how do I make sure the blood stays flowing to the front part of the brain <laughs> right. and they don't get triggered yeah. literally into into want into fight or flight, which you can't control, by the way. Mm -hmm. So that's the design problem is I've got to get you there mm -hmm. before you think scary stuff mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. I can't do this or I'm going to look stupid or, or all of those sorts of things that actually get in the way of learning. Um, that's biology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I think, um, they think data is the, the, the solution to that. You know, we'll, we'll overcome <laughs> this fight or flight with more data. The solution is more data. I'm just going to pack it with data and evidence and <laughs> have the facts. What do you think about and that? Does that work? Those, those people have clearly not been paying attention to, <laughs> to, to world politics in the last <laughs> few years. I, yeah. Yeah. People, people, human beings, homo sapiens, you yeah. know, First, figure out who's in my tribe, who's with mm. me, who's right. 10,000 years ago, we're hunting mammoth. Who's hunting mammoth with me? Who's helping me look for wild carrots, right? What? Who, who's with me? Those other people want to steal my carrots, right? And so, and if you didn't have that response, they stole your carrots, <laughs> right? You, you have to stay with your group of people. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, so we decide who's with us, who do we like? first and then we decide that's the data we'll listen to so mm -hmm. actually relationships come before data so you can't yeah. you can't break down uh you're wrong about this here is all of the data mm -hmm. until you've built up trust and become a trustworthy source of information and that doesn't happen with data that happens with emotions and other kinds of things and so again emotion learning is deeply emotional but it, but it is it is fundamentally about who do I listen to? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I say, people, look, next time you're doing a discussion in class, right? Put some, put some earplugs in and watch people, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could, you can see what's happening in the discussion, right? So do I raise my hand? Will I look stupid? Ooh, I like her. I don't want to embarrass myself. I want to be on the lacrosse team. He's on the lacrosse team. He just said that I'll agree with him. I mean, right. That's what's going on in your brain is your is, is all the social cueing. There's a reason that juries don't go into the room and go, OK, who thinks he's guilty? Because if the first person says guilty, I'm sitting next. To, I'm sitting in the room going, well, I bet you everybody agrees with him. And my not guilty is going to seem I bet you I'm the only one. Right. You become less sure of your answer. Mm -hmm. But if I thought he was guilty and the first guy who speaks up says guilty, I go, yeah. And I feel more <laughs> confident. And you've seen this in faculty meetings, right? We've all <laughs> we've all seen this that you're thinking they're thinking what to think, and then somebody else has said, and you go, "Yeah!" And all the, right, you're all of a sudden you're more willing to say something because mm -hmm. somebody has already said it, and you agree with it, right? And so your brain is 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 trying to figure out what's going to happen to you socially, yeah. To, given what you think, and so when you ask students to change their minds, you're really asking. Are you willing to change your friends? Are you willing to change Whoa. your friends' minds? Right. Because, right, if, if it's the choice between a new idea from you, the professor, and having to make new friends versus, no, none of my friends think that, 
and and we, we there's 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 mountains of evidence in in a million different ways. You know, we even see it on Facebook, right? Students who have more of their high school friends on Facebook and and don't make as many college friends are less likely to change their minds, right? We see right Pe- people, you know, they're less likely to stay in school actually, right? Wow. Because they're because they're getting all of the right. They're on. They're talking to their high school friends, and their high school views are being right said again and again. And I think. You know, this stuff I'm hearing, if I start to believe the stuff I'm hearing in college, these people are going to hate me. Yeah. So so I think we we, we forget that classrooms are yeah. social places. Humans are social creatures. Learning is a social mm-hmm. activity. And so that that way before data can have an effect, we've got to start. We've got to start with. What are the emotions people feel are feeling? Yeah. What are the relations they're feeling? How safe do they feel? Do they feel like they matter in my classroom? Will their opinion be counted equal weight? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. those things are way more important uh, than uh, you know. Here's another study I'm going to cite. Right. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of sitting with that because I never. Um, I, I think a lot of people don't think about that. They really focus on, you know, I'm going to put this in my lecture or, you know, my presentation, whatever it's going to be. And I just have to make this as convincing as possible, sometimes with examples, sometimes with data, without kind of thinking of the, each person in the audience in their own context, like within that room. But like you said, like it, it could even be broader than that. And I mean, yeah. What if they do have to choose between your new idea and their friends or their family? Right. I mean, there's their just religion, like, their, their religion. religion, everything. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of what you're up against. So, well, how do you do that? <laughs> like, how do you, well, so, how, so how do you've you... got to, so you've got to go in gently. Right. So mm-hmm. like one, one of the, one of my, you know, uh, standard pieces of advice for reading a better discussion is, you know, don't start by get, by asking people what they think. Don't, don't start with a deep question. Mm-hmm. Right. Start with let's let's come up with some lists. Let's think of all of the reasons that this would be a good idea and some reasons it would be a bad idea. OK. Right? E- and have everybody do it. Right. And the more controversial the topic, the less you want to die, right? the slower you've got to sneak your way in. Right. Mm-hmm. So let's see what are the di- how many different ways could we have of thinking about this topic? Right. Mm-hmm. So let's mm-hmm. we're going to talk about abortion today. Nobody has any opinions about that. OK, so let's think about <laughs> what are the different ways we could frame. Right. What are the different how many different sets of rights are at stake? How many different people's interests are at stake? Do the grandparents have an interest? Does society have an interest? Mm-hmm. Right. The mother, the baby. Right. Do do institution. Right. Let's start with by thinking about what are the different. Right. That's not as personal to me. Right. That's not what do where are my beliefs at? Start with neutral questions mm-hmm. um, and help. And again, you know, three things for three things against, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, start, start with, with making, with making lists, with reframing the questions. Uh, You know, I'm also a big fan of things like polarity mapping, you know, figuring out what are the, Mm -hmm. what are the tensions here? So liberty and justice, right? So liberty and justice are, are not a problem to solve. You can't have a hundred percent of both, right? Because Mm -hmm. if you have too much liberty, it impedes on justice. You have too much justice, you have less, right? Et cetera. So, okay. So what happens if we have only a hundred percent liberty? Right. Everybody can do whatever they want. Well, I could, you know, I can kill whoever I want. Okay. So what would, the, is that going to be justice? So then, I mean, we go around and we think, oh, okay. So, right. So there, there are, there are competing interests here. Mm-hmm. So now we have a tension to manage, right? Mm-hmm. We have to balance competing interests. That's a lot easier to have as a discussion. The same is true. Again, abortion, I meant, you know, right. We have different, we have different interests to balance. Mm-hmm. And that's hard uh, rather than, than saying, well, you know, what do you believe? What are these things? You know, let's think. So I, I think we have to figure out um, how to, how to open up that space for students. And so I often ambiguity is one of them mm. uh, that uh, talking about, amb- you know, so it could be something else. Let's find an, let's find a favorite movie clip or a food, uh, you know, uh, and let's talk about something that's ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, avocados. Right. OK. They're good for you, but they're but they're fat, but they're a good fat. Right. They're ambiguous. It turns mm-hmm. out that if I have a discussion about avocados or about, you know, something ambiguous. And then I have students do math problems. They try more math problems than the students who don't, because I <laughs> opened up the idea that there are different ways of looking at this thing. 
Ah. Right. And so people are more willing to try stuff. So so the idea of creating nuance and ambiguity in the classroom. So what's the thing that we tend to do? We tend to do the opposite. I'm the professor. Here are some facts. Here's yep. some stuff I know. That's another thing we tend to do. So in fact, one of the best things you can do is by by creating, well, you know, I used to think that. Now I think this, or are my dis our discipline? We yeah. used to do this. We mm -hmm. as doctors, we used to use leeches, and now they're back. And we used to do this, or we you know we used to think that, and then it changed because we thought about that, and then we thought and then that changed too. That opens up a lot of space for students to say, well, I maybe have a new idea that may change the way that you think. Mm -hmm. But it opens up the idea that that what we're here to do is co-create knowledge, and and again figure out you bring your closet, I bring mine, not just. Here's a bunch of stuff I know. Write right. this down, right. which, which often again doesn't doesn't work. But it's also not memorable. Yeah, learning learning is about making connections. So mm. in order to make connections, I need one of two things. I either need to know a lot of other stuff that you know mm -hmm. can't do that yet, right. or I need to connect with what you're saying with the stuff I already know. Yeah. It's a bit like when when I I do I use a lot of right we all use analogies we say you know yeah. this is like that it's like so if I say so you know uh, uh, char shoe is like a crep lock if you don't know what a crep lock <laughs> is I haven't helped right it's like it's like <laughs> neither one of those things so I say oh well a crep lock is like an egg roll it's like oh I had an egg roll right I I, I can it only works if you know the thing I'm comparing it to. And <laughs> yeah. so when I didn't I, know the, either. I don't know exactly. if anybody watching did. I did not know either one. Well, that, well, that's that's the point. I chose. I chose. <laughs> I chose two example. crazy things because it's like <laughs> you're st right, and that's what yeah. happens on the first day of most classes. You say, "Oh, well, it's like this, it's like that," and it's like I don't know what any of those things mean. Yeah. So, so I don't. I don't have an anchor until you know what I already know. Oh, well, mm. who knows what an egg roll is? If, does everybody? Okay, great. So we can talk about it's like an egg roll, or it's like a. A beer is like a hamburger. It's also like an egg. Let's say that now we're having a conversation where I can start to say, let's connect it with things that I know. But otherwise, it's just, you know, words. And so yeah. that may have meaning to us because we have all those connections. So so learning is about making connections, mm -hmm. actually, literally, right in your brain. That's mm -hmm, what you're mm -hmm. doing. You're, and that's how you figure it. And, and if you can't make connection fairly quickly, your hippocampus says, bye bye. Yeah, it just dump, it just dumps it because it's, I, it's gone. I mean, I have, there's no place to put it. Again, it's, it's like it's like yeah. it's like if I'm it's like when you're at a party. It's another analogy: you're, you're at a party and you're holding your glass of wine and you're eating your 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 hors d'oeuvre or your past, and then somebody wants to shake your hand, and it's like, well, I've either got to eat this thing or put it down, right? Because I don't have any more hands. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so you discard something. Mm -hmm. to do the next thing. And that's yep. actually how cognitive load works too. I was just going to say, this is sounding like we're getting in like working memory kind yes. of <laughs> kind of territory here and cognitive overload. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I think, I think a lot of people who teach and create presentations uh, overestimate how long it takes for people to reach that point. Um, or, the, or they, they sort of, yeah, overestimate um, people's ability to sort of like struggle through um, before that happens, but it can happen very quickly. I mean, it can happen within the first 30 seconds of a lecture or, or a talk if that beginning sort of isn't making that connection or letting people know that we'll be making connections. So, so yeah, that's. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm still making this. I make this mistake all the time, yeah. but, but at least now I know that when I when so my first draft of a new, I've just, I just finished a new course. And mm -hmm. so my first draft I know has, has about you know has at least 50 percent too much probably yeah. 100, right? i have oh. way way too much stuff and so oh, i know that now i'm going to be throwing stuff away mm -hmm. and saving stuff for later and that's mm -hmm. a painful process right yeah. loss is hard yeah but the more i teach i you know i've but over over years 40 years i've discovered that every time i teach i teach less i take out i take out stuff every semester um, if I add one thing in, one thing has got to go out, usually two things. Um, but it's rarely the case that I say, gosh, that course didn't have enough content. Well, in fact, it's never the case. <laughs> right. So so I think we have to be gentle with ourselves. And so what I do is I say, OK, every summer, uh, you know, I revisit the courses I'm going to teach in the fall mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I figure out what I can do less of what did not stick. Yeah. And so student feedback is really powerful here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most of our student evaluations are 
rubbish. And I, you know, I want to know what changed your life, what really stuck, what did not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are good um, questions. Those are things that I can actually use. And the question that I most like is I, what, what, what was the thing that most changed your mind? You know, uh, that's what I want to do more of and like everything that. else I can do less of. And so, but, but figuring out what is the, what is the goal of the course? What really helped advance that goal? And so, and then I, I do less of the rest. Um, but, but in the same way that, you know, when you were talking a minute ago, I thought, oh, I really, this really, I got all sorts, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's how my brain works because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm accessing what's in my closet. Uh, but that's not where your brain is working. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I like uh, you also just mentioned sort of you you never look back on your course and think, oh, I don't have enough content. Um, <laughs> so I have a few questions sort of about about that and connecting that to your student questions. So when you ask people what changed your mind, um, do you find that it's like what does change their mind? Is it a good is it a good lecture? Is it, <laughs> is it an activity? And yeah, I'm, I'm sort of curious about, about that. Um, was it, was it content? <laughs> uh, it can be content, but it's always content in context, nice. right? Because changing your mind means that some of the stuff that you brought with you has either gone away. It's become irrelevant, mm. right? A belief in X or Y, or it's shifted its position. Mm -hmm. right. so, 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 so we, we think, okay, if I stuff this content in here, now you'll have more stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. what, what I need to do is I need to adjust the other things. It's, it's like if your closet is full, right, and you buy a new pair of shoes, you've got to either reorganize and get rid of something yeah. or like figure out that, oh, actually, those aren't shoes. Those are boots. They can go, right? I've got to, I have to do some other kind of cognitive work. And so when students say they've changed their mind, what they say is, I realize that that I used to think this and now I think that. But more often it's, you know, I came in thinking that this these were the categories and now mm -hmm. I think these are the categories. Um, and so That's big. in music, we say, all the music you hate sounds alike, right? Because you don't have, you don't make distinctions. It's like all country mm. music sounds alike. That's because you don't make, right? You don't like, you don't make <laughs> distinctions. If you learned about it, yeah. you would be able to tell the difference. But when you don't know something, it's all kind of, you know, one amorphous thing. And so if we think about our job as trying to help students make better categories, mm -hmm which again, only you can do. And everybody's categories will be a little bit different, yep, right? Yep. Schema, if you want to use the, mm. the, you know, the real term. But uh, so I'm, you know, if you help students make schema, those are, those are big changes to the way that they think and the way that they can then process new information later after you've left me, mm -hmm. uh, which again is back to my music. You know, I started off, yeah. I don't want to be here forever going, you know what? The Beethoven needs more practice. Right. <laughs> Eventually, you need to be able to make those decisions yourself. Is it no, no, that's ready, go, or no, 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 that needs more work. Right. But, but when you're with me, that's my job. And so, so I, you know, I often, I often say, you know, education is preparation for the unknown. That, that yeah. we are, tr we are, we are really trying because most of what you need to know, I can't teach you. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been invented or discovered yet, or mm -hmm. it's not relevant yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There are some things that were still true about science, but science is always evolving. And so, what I really want are scientists that are going to be able to rethink the model when they learn new things mm -hmm. in the same way that I want, you know, I mean, you know, think about the, the, the guy in medical school, I actually know this guy who, you know, got it, got an A plus in scalpel, right. And now doesn't use one because it's all, you know, laparoscopic, you know, right. <laughs> his, his goal, his goal is to not have to ever suit you know cut or suture again yeah to go in through an orifice you already have which is gross i know and, <laughs> but but right so it's yeah. like wow i mean that so if, if you'd said wow i'm really good at scalpel i want to keep doing this which is what most of us do and so uh mm -hmm. that's hard for us to 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 understand our own obsolescence Ooh. that that my yeah. job is it in fact my job as a teacher right. is to make myself obsolete yeah my job is for you not to need me anymore that I have taught you again and not enough content, mm -hmm. but I've taught you enough ways of processing and learning and creating schema that you can now process material on your own. And the truth is there's lots of material in books and on the internet that you can go learn from. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So if I've made myself obsolete, I've done my job. Yeah. And that's uh, a huge shift in, I, I think, like even when I first started teaching, I was focused on content and not not even building critical thinking skills or the ability to change and be creative and come up with new ideas. And I'm going to link in the description of this video because I, I watched your TEDx talk um, about the, the, the new three R's um, of education. And I think you make a really strong case for you know, not teaching content, but teaching change and the ability to change. Um, and I just think that a lot of people are stuck with just, I'm going to share facts or I'm going to share a timeline. Here's a timeline. Here's a year that this thing happened. And here's a year that that thing happened. And then a year that that thing happened. And there you go. Now, you know, years and what happened, right? Like instead of, well, how does that help you? Yeah, I should say that, you know, I, I'm not opposed like, to content. I mean, I, I do think you, you have to teach content. Yes. Uh, yes. But because you because humans don't think in the abstract, we think in concrete ideas. Yes. But it but it is the balance between concrete and process. Always and so balance. <laughs> we, we often say we teach some process and some content. But when you actually observe, it's 99% content and this much process. Mm. Uh, and another way to think about it is content is give a student a fish and process is teach a student how to fish. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. clearly if the student is hungry, mm -hmm. the fish is useful and to start off. Right. But ultimately what you want to do is to have this, the student be self-sufficient. And so even in, you know, what we think of as, you know, content heavy courses, you know, introductory STEM courses and mm -hmm. places where you have to, you know, there is a bunch of stuff that you have to learn to do the next, do the yes. next course. Um, it's still more exciting and more interesting to learn to think like a scientist. And it's, it's, we are, we, we are motivators, right? If you think about it, mm. none of us can do the work. Only mm -hmm. the student can do the work, right? Yeah. I, 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 so it's, again, it's like laying out the buffet or saying, here's all, I'm going to give you all of this content. Um, I think the better analogy is here are a bunch of rocks. I need you to move them to the top of the hill not that motivating we're going to build a cathedral that your grandchildren mm. are going to pray in in a hundred years mm -hmm. now let's move these rocks well mm -hmm. it turns out actually people in that right that you now say you know what i'm going to let you figure out how to move the rocks there's a rope there's a horse there's some right but that's even more motivating right you know what i think you can do these rocks are not too big for you right so in fact motivation into what we call intrinsic motivation psychology is based upon yeah. right salience is it relevant am i engaged optimism can i if i can't i'm gonna be motivated and agency do i have some some agency here where i can do things and so i, I think we need to think about des design that starts with those three things because if you don't have those three things when your lecture is done or your class is over or your piano lesson and the student has to go home and practice or do the work or the homework they're not going to do as much. They're not as motivated. And so what I need to do is to build the motivation. And the so motivation comes through reason. Why is this important? Mm -hmm. Right. What, yes, you can learn this. And yes, you have some choice. If I can build those things, then you're more likely to do the reading or do or watch the whatever. See, and I love that you said this because a lot of people really uh, push back <laughs> sometimes um, on me with this idea that you should try to motivate your audience. And the most common thing I hear when I talk about that is, well, I mean, my students need to meet me halfway. And, you know, and, and typically that's used as a way to say, I don't need to motivate them. That's up top. That's to them to motivate themselves. That's why I just am here sharing my wall of text. Well, but the, <laughs> but the, op the operative word in both of those sentences need. Yeah. Right. Is, is need. If, if, if I can say that you need to eat your broccoli and you know, mm. you're an, you're an adult, you don't have to do it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, all, the all broccoli diet is not right. You were eventually going to say, you know what, I'm done with the broccoli diet. I, I want to have some pizza. I want to have some fun. And so you can say you need your broccoli, but it's not a very, right. If, if, if that, if it was enough to say you need your broccoli, <laughs> right. Then everybody in America would be eating their broccoli all the time. <laughs> That's all, you know. So yes. but it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll give so I'll give me give you an example. So you got you got you got two possibilities. I could say, look to you. Let me explain to you Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblance. 
I'm going to tell you what it's about and here's what it is. Or I could say, so look, and this is a true story. So this is a, 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 a professor that I had in college who put up at the end of class, put up a picture of his family and said, so I want, so he didn't say anything about family resemblance, nothing about Wittgenstein. That was his ending. But he says, so look at this picture. It's my family. See my kids, the dog. So he says, do you think all of my kids look like me or like my wife? Right. Can you find some connections? Like who has my nose? Who has my wife's nose? Just, does, does the girl who has my wife knows also have my eyes or her, right? And they, so students start looking for connections. Yeah. And they realize, so in fact, this group of objects is connected. They don't all share the same thing, but there's a group of things like, no, like, right. My, some of them have the nose, some have them, right. Some, right. Et cetera. Does that make sense? So that, so you know what? So that, that concept is called family resemblance. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was written by this guy named Wittgenstein. I want you to read the philosophical investigation. I think it's 51 or 52, um, where he talks yeah. about this for next Wednesday. Okay, yes. so I'm I'm great. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. One more thing. By the way, all my kids were adopted. Thanks. See you Tuesday. Oh, that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> that's a that's a one cent, right? That right now it's like, well, I thought I understood. Oh. Now I don't. But I'm curious, right? You've created curiosity and wonder. Curiosity, yes. So now yes. I think I want to. I, I thought I understood it. I thought it was actually a pretty interesting. It is kind of an interesting concept, mm -hmm. but clearly there's something that can go horribly wrong, and so I need to think about this. And so that's what I mean by creating mm -hmm. motivation. I, I don't mean, you know, I've got to go out there and be a motivational coach. I mean right. designing things. And the analogy that I use is, you know, fitness coaches. You know, mm. I, I, you, d you don't gain a whole lot by watching somebody else do push-ups. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, so a good fitness coach gets me to do the push-ups and they do yep. that with motivation, but they also do it with structure, right? Mm. Nobody says we're going to do a hundred push-ups today. Right. Say, oh, I'm done. I'm not going to your, okay, we're going to start with five. Let's do five. Can you do three more? Can you do one more? Okay. Right. You did 10. Oh, I didn't <laughs> know I could, right. If you had said do 10, I would have given up it. Right. Yeah. But I did five and then three more and then one more and then one more again. Right. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's structure. And so that's mm -hmm. exactly the analogy that teachers need to do. And yes, is it a trick? Sure it is. It's design. <laughs> it's designing to get you to do the yeah. work that only you can do. Mm -hmm. and that it turns out that while lecturing is not always bad, lecturing is is not a good way to convey content. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Lecture is good for other things. Le sermons work not <laughs> because of the content, but because they're motivating. Mm. Right? A lecture is like a sermon. Right? It's 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 it it it's not about wow. Okay, I wrote down all those passages he mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's about the thread and about what it gets me yeah. to think about and how it gets me to reconceptualize something in my life. And so that's how a sermon works. And so a lecture can do that. Right. Talking can do that really well. But it's not good for conveying long lists of numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, right. All, here, here are here are 55 numbers you should remember. Oof. Right? No, yeah. Nobody would do. Right. But mm -hmm. that's kind of what we do a lot. We think, well, here's a bunch of stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, so um it's it's a it's about the through line, and so if you want people yeah. to learn concepts, uh, you've got to give them a chance to practice them, to apply them, to yes. you know plug them in, to connect them. Uh, yep. There you go. So now you know. Obviously, my channel is about uh, presentations, like slide presentations. So I am curious <laughs> what you think the role of like presentation slides are in all of this. Um, like, how does that, how does that fit in? When should we use them? How often should we use them in our courses? So I think you do great work. I've learned a lot about presentation <laughs> slides. I actually like presentation slides. You know, I'm a, I'm a six words or less sort of, you know, I mean, but I've also <laughs> realized that, right, so the slides can do different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I, I've, slides have become for me the way I organize you know what I'm going to do. So I have, you know, I use gray slides for when students are going to do activities. I, you know, I have, I have a, a kind of a thing that keeps, and then I can think, oh, it's been four slides without a gray slide. I need to put a gray slide in, you know, I, I think, mm -hmm. um, but they also, I use, I, I, since I know that reading slides is a problem and I'm going to read too much information, making slides does force me to distill content. Yeah. It also writes slides. If you think about it, right. Part of that, when you when we were talking earlier about how we all, when we first start to teach, we focus on content. Mm -hmm. Most of that is insecurity. 
Yeah. Right? It's our own. We're, we're, we want to make sure that students yeah. know we're smart, that we actually know what we're thinking. And it's like, actually, that wasn't a problem. Students were going to. And the truth is, you could talk for an hour without even blinking. And you, right? we, we all have way more content, but we all are insecure about that. So we want to make sure I say I got to make sure I say this. I got to make sure I get that in. I got to do all that. Well, I find that when I put two words on a slide, I know I'm going to talk for 20 minutes. And so <laughs> it but while I I've wandered off into that cul-de-sac, which I shouldn't have. At least the students can see what the connection was on the slide, right? Mm -hmm. What is what was the what is the what is the anchor? Mm -hmm. And so slides are like the anchor. What is, what are the what is the through line? What are the what are the important mm -hmm. concepts? And what I find I do when I go back and revise classes. So I I almost always revise the slides. My slides are getting better, thanks in part to you, but but thanks also to the fact <laughs> that I go back. Yep. And then I say, okay, how can I do this in fewer words? Yes. Love and it. so I, I end up thinking, okay, <laughs> yeah. what, it's like, I, I now think, okay, here's, and I end up with pithy saying, you know, what, what are the, what's a memorable mm -hmm. sentence? What's a, mm -hmm. what's a, what's a better way to say this? What really goes at the top of the page? Okay. Yeah. That's the concept. And I'll talk about that, mm -hmm. but what's mm -hmm. the word I want them to think about that connects this to the last idea. And so, so I think that, that, that slides are, are, you know, we're, we are visual pictures worth a thousand words, you know, so I do, I use a lot of images. Mm -hmm. um, I do think slides without images. So I, I think, I, I think I, you're right, uh, you know, about its images, its quality of images. But the other thing about images is that they force you to use less text. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a big fan of putting an image on the whole screen and then only being able to put words in the margin, right? In the places where they, where they show up. <laughs> Right. Because it really yep. limits what if I, if you put the, you know, you know, PowerPoint always wants you to put the image over there <laughs> and then it lines right, the design idea. And it's Don't like, use design ideas, please. Right. Nobody. Yeah, use them. Here, here's here's this, your here's your 12 point font over here. And here's your picture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> so it, it's much it's much better to say, OK, if I have this picture, yeah. what am I going to what what does it mean in a word or two? Or what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? Mm -hmm. What is my brain going to do when I see that picture? And how mm -hmm. can I connect it to other things? Yeah. And so that, um, so I find slides help me do that. Mm -hmm. And and when I reduce the slides, I don't necessarily reduce the talking, <laughs> but a little bit, right? It does help. And so it does help me say, oh, okay, I've got to get to an activity. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so look, you do need to introduce concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. You, no, you, 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 you it, slides and, and your lectures are also when you p convey your personality and your enthusiasm, uh, when you build yeah. relationships. And so, so yeah. all of that does happen. Your slides have personality, mm -hmm. uh, just like a brand has personality, right? So, I mean, I, I, you yeah. know, I teach, you know, branding is not just the words it's, you know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A has a image, right? You know, the, the you know, the, the mm -hmm. Coke polar bear, you know, they they have a personality. And so your, your personality is something you're also conveying. Yep. And, and so I think, uh, but, but, but again, I think a system where you recognize that every couple of slides, you've got to take a break, a question, a poll. And yes. so slides are a way to make sure that you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do, I, and I, thanks to you, I use, I'm more comfortable using a lot of slides Yay! <laughs> because yes. I used to think, oh God, I've got to have fewer slides. And then I oh. thought, well, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I talk about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're right about, it. I think, I think you've yeah. really changed my mind, but now I've got to change everybody else's mind because they always say you have too many slides when <sighs> I send them the deck in advance. And it's like, nope, you don't, no you don't understand these are, these are, are going to be, you know, yeah. um, there's going to be an image here. There's not a lot of words. Look yeah. at, I say, look at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, because you know, kind of like we were talking about earlier, I mean, when people see a wall of text on a slide, they're gone. Like they just go away and they disengage because they kind of know their working memory is just not even going to be able to handle it anyway. <laughs> so they're like, why bother? I'll just go to TikTok or whatever it is. So yeah, having, you know, just changing it um, helps people see it's, it's, uh, it's motivating because they're like, I can, I can grasp this one slide with this pithy statement and um yeah so or slides so, with the puzzle actually i'm a big ooh. fan of, of 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 slides it's not unlike the wittgenstein example with the family yeah. resemblance right it's, yeah. it's it's the one liner oh and by the way <laughs> all of my kids are adopted i love it so when you're when you're if your slide pops up and i know and i understand everything about it my brain is less intrigued in the same yeah. way that predi predicting is another yes. one of those things 
What do you yeah. think is going to be on the next slide? Well, that's a, I have no way of knowing. But the fact that I've made a prediction now brings me to the edge of my seat and I'm now invested. Right, I, I'm invested. And so your yeah. brain, your brain cares more. So the first part of the slide, you know, I use a lot of the animations again. So the first part of the slide should, should be a puzzle. Yeah. It should be, how do these two things yep. go together? What is the connection between that and that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Build that mystery, build that curiosity. Um, yeah, so yeah. Two, two pictures that I yeah. can then explain. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I think, I do think the hardest part of this, and I, I struggle with this too, is that, oh, I'm going to forget. Or yeah. I haven't, if I teach this course a year from now, yep. I will go, why is there an old lady on a bicycle and a gorilla on this slide? <laughs> and there's no words. And right. I don't, I forgot the funny thing I was going to do. And it's like, you know, I use, you know, but that's mm -hmm. what your notes are for. And that's why you prepare and you go back and look yep. at your notes and you say, oh, right. you tell the story about the gorilla and the old lady. And, the, and then it's like, okay, that, that's yep. how that works. But, um, yep. but I do, and I do go back to slides that I haven't taught over a year. And I think, Wow, this must have been really good at some point. And I have no <laughs> idea what it means now, but that's okay. I mean, hey, you know, you know <laughs> it's but, a I, chance but those, to yeah, think of something new and, and updated, I guess, or or cut it, which is good because <laughs> I, yeah. I probably talked about it for twenty minutes and everybody <sighs> went. Well, you know. Yep, exactly. <laughs> oh. Oh my goodness. Well, I feel like I could <laughs> ask a million questions, but um, just um, keeping an eye on the time here, I, I have one more question for you. Um, what is maybe the one question you wished more people would ask you about improving their course? Uh, well, the one question I wish they would stop asking. First Ooh, okay. Is, that is works. I still is, you know, <laughs> um, but how do I cover all the content? Oh, because yeah. The, the answer is you can't. Yes. In the same way that I can say, well, I cooked the 75 course meal. How do I get everybody to eat it? It's like nobody can eat that much. Right. You, you've your your content exceeds the human capacity. Well, I did it. It's like, well, yes and no. A, you were weird. You were you were the unusual <laughs> kid who got the whole course on his hand for the final exam. I actually had a friend who did that. And it's like, how did wow, you know? <laughs> he got the whole course in notes on the inside of his hand for, you know, and, uh, and the other thing is that, uh, you know, you're, yeah. uh, you probably spent way more time than the average student can spend. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't have a job or three kids to raise or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you, you have to accept the limitations of human yeah. beings and especially yeah. of, of students today. So here's another one, right? This mm -hmm. is, you asked earlier about, oh, well, they need to meet me halfway. The students have to. <laughs> so the question I wish people would ask is, uh, you know, how do I figure out where my students really are and what they're really capable of? Yes, I love that. Oh, that's, would, that's yeah. a question. Well, that's so, a good one. so ask them, mm -hmm. right? Do, do a pre-class survey, mm -hmm. but recognize that you have your interests. You have what you want to accomplish, but I have the capacity of who's in front of me. And COVID diminished that capacity in two important ways. One is right cognitive bandwidth, right? When you're worried about your grandparents dying, you're worried about having enough food, you're worried about rent, you, you're unable yep. to do anything else. And if you don't believe me, yep. Roy Baumeister did wonderful cookies and radishes experiment, the, right, the, the famous cookies and radishes where he brought students in to do a test. And he didn't say anything about free cookies. Everybody could smell the cookies in the bakery next door. So one group of students was given cookies while they did their math problems. And the other group of students, oh, God, I'm sorry that you know, they're making cookies next door, but we have these radishes for you. <laughs> and remember, nobody was promised cookies, but I can smell cookies. <laughs> so the students who were given radishes while they could smell cookies did a lot fewer math problems. Right? I mean. That's so good. That's so clever. Yeah, isn't that a great radishes. experiment? Right at the radishes and cookies experiment. So, so when COVID. students are worried, they have so students during COVID had yeah. less bandwidth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Students after COVID still have less bandwidth because oh, yeah. the world is a is a is a stressful place right now. Yeah. But the mm -hmm. other thing is that especially students who are traditional age coming straight out of high school, they lost a year. Right. The estimates yeah. are they lost eight months to a year and a half of actual academic achievement. That means, right, they weren't in they weren't in classrooms for a long time. Yeah. They 
didn't get the socialization, which is part of this. They didn't get mm -hmm. the learn. They didn't learn. So, so they know less and they're cognitively stressed. So they are not going to be as capable of doing things that you could do while you were on a full scholarship at Penn when you're whatever, you know, whatever the thing yeah. was. And mm -hmm. so we have to figure out what they're capable of doing. And then mm -hmm. again, not unlike a fitness coach, right? Well, you mm -hmm. know, I can't, I can only do one pull up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where I start. I mean, you want to get me to five pull-ups later on, but you got to start by not saying, well, 10 pull-ups is your first assignment. It's like, no, I'm done. I can't, I can do one. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, starting where you start is actually the most important question where you end is a different question, but we often think mm -hmm. that's all that matters. And so teaching starts always with what matters to your students. It ends, I mean, right, the end game is what matters to me. Where do I want to, I, here's where I want to get you. Mm -hmm. But that can't be the only question you ask. The first question has to be, where are they starting? And then the question is, how do I get them from here to there? And uh, that's where design comes in. And we often think, well, if I just present them with all this content, it it should work. Well, but it doesn't. So, th right, the evidence is is there that it doesn't work. So pay attention. Yeah. It's not working. Love it. All right. Hopefully everybody watching starts asking that question and stops trying to share all the content. And hopefully, like, I mean, even when you said that, because I'm I'm working on a, a course and I'm even still stuck with like, oh, I have so many things that I, I want to share. And it kind of is a little bit of a relief. So maybe hopefully people heard that and it kind of takes the pressure off. Like you can't, you can't. So um, re, you know, change the question to where can I start? Um, I like that. <laughs> where can I start and how, where, where can I, where, where can I get them to that's, yeah. that's, that's cognitively possible. And again, a yeah. fitness coach would understand Yeah. most of your, most of your people are at the, at the seniors gym. They're, they're not going to go to the Olympics, you know, and, and we all think, oh, I, it's the, I want to get everybody into graduate school. No, it's, it's no. really, it's in the single digits. And, mm -hmm. and so we, yes, we all want to replicate each other, but ultimately you've got to recognize that, um, Success for other people is how they define it, not how you define it. And so let's figure out how they define success and help them achieve their goals. Or as I said at the beginning, find your own voice. My, my job is to help you figure out the voice that you want to have, not so that you sound like me. Right. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Well, hopefully for whoever is watching, um, and finding all of these insights, amazing. Um, you have a book, or, I mean, you have multiple books, but the recent book is Teaching Change. So I don't know if you wanted to just talk about it a little bit and what people can learn if they pick up the book and, or, you know, if people want to connect with you, um, you know, what would you like to, right. to share in terms of that? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the the book is the magnum opus. It's it it contains a lot of what's in the earlier couple of books. Uh, the next book will be thinner, absolutely. I promise. I promise. This is that's the big book. Uh, so uh, I've yeah, seen I worse. Know. I know. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, but it's it's uh, it's too long. It's twice as long. So 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 half of that book is coming out in another book. But um, <laughs> but as a website, there's teachingnaked.com. There's josebowen.com. Um, they both link to the same. So there's lots and lots of resources there. Uh, there's a contact me form there too. Uh, but there's lots of free stuff. Um, and there's videos and sorts of things. Um, the, the book itself, uh, I think, is a mix of practical tips. You know, there, there are teaching hacks in every chapter, often multiple um, sets of them. Uh, but there's also, you know, some psychology, you know, some of the stuff we talked about, cognitive load, how, how learning actually works. Uh, there are a couple chapters on discussion. Um, and then there's chapters on relationships, resilience, and reflection, what I call the new three R's. Uh, and why they matter, and then again, how to make them work. And then at the, the very end, there's a there's a couple of chapters on sort of larger systemic issues, how to how to think about education. But uh, but it, really, the target for the book is is faculty, people who are teaching and and want to both get information that will you know give them look theory. I, I, I use I show students. I say students, ah, don't give us any more theory. And I so I, I have a picture of my slide. Sigmund Freud and John Wayne. <laughs> yeah. And I say, so what do you know about these two guys? It's like Sigmund Freud, right? It's like theory, right? 
John Wayne, action, oh. right? So, so sometimes you want actions, but I said, but what's the advantage? When do you need insight, right? Yeah. How do you know what to do, right? In order to know what to do, you've got to first have some sense of, well, actually, here's what the real problem is. Those guys aren't the problem. Don't shoot them. These guys are the real, right? Whatever. So, so actually, there is some, there is some reason to have theory. We don't mm-hmm. just want tips. Here are, here are a bunch of tips. Well, oh, some of, sometimes what I want is insight into, well, why does this, why is this going to work? But what you really want is both, right? You don't just mm-hmm. want an army of Sigmund Freuds. We want a couple of John Waynes too. And so, that's good. <laughs> uh, but that's actually, that's funny you mentioned, you know, in this context, because that actually is one of my favorite slides in terms of it's two images yep. mm-hmm. that people start, well, who are those guys and why are they there together? And yeah. then what do I make of this? So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Something maybe I, I should have asked and um, forgotten. Oh, lots of things you should have. No, no. I know. Look, I've, <laughs> I've enjoyed this a lot and I, I, I admire the work you do. And, and anybody who's Likewise. made it this far, <laughs> you deserve a medal. You clearly care about teaching. Yes. Uh, and so so ultimately, give yourself a break. You know, go have a glass of wine because because you you are you are in it to win it and and you care about your students and it's the people who are not watching who are the problem. Yeah. So give yourself <laughs> a break on um, that you care that you care enough yeah. to have paid attention this far is is amazing and yeah. teaching especially teaching change but teaching is really 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 hard mm-hmm. work and mm-hmm. uh, they don't they don't they don't pay us enough and so we do it for love and uh so remember that our motivation is what's key nice ah well said thank you so much this is so fun having you here and have a great day bye everyone thanks everybody bye bye